Congressman Jake Elzey of Waxahachie, thank you so much for joining us. We're in your office today, appreciate it. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you just got back from Israel, and I wanted to know what the highlights were for you on this trip and why it was so important for you to go. Jack, it's great to be with you. Uh, the, the trip to Israel was a life-changing event for both me and my wife. We went on a bipartisan group of congressmen and spouses or uh, significant others. Uh, one guy brought his daughter, uh, members of the House Armed Services Committee or veterans. And it was, it was a mix of both cultural and historic religious sites and military sites. And as a 20-year naval aviator, I had flown over Israel in 2001 before 9-11 and I recognized how, just how small that country was and in a very short amount of time you reach the other border. So I view things from the lens of a military man and it's remarkable how small that nation is and how surrounded they are by folks who don't believe that Israel has a right to exist. So we met with local leaders, we met with uh, governmental leaders, we met with Netanyahu and the opposition leader, we met with the director of the Mossad, the chief of staff of the armed forces, the minister of defense, and a whole lot of uh, 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 folks who are involved in the defense of Israel. So we got a really good clear look at the threats that Israel faces on a daily basis. My wife said she felt very much at home there and I will tell you that it was, it was a beautiful country. We stayed in, in, um, in Jerusalem for five nights and there's nothing quite like watching the sunrise in Jerusalem with the smell of honeysuckle. It was a, it was a wonderful trip. And you said you met with uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, who is a controversial figure on the world stage, uh, even in Israel. And so I'm wondering, um, what did you discuss with him? We discussed the, the defense of Israel, uh, our ties with the United States, and I will tell you this, it wouldn't matter which side of the aisle they are in the Knesset, which is their legislature, they all wanted to say thank you to the United States of America and our people for helping them defend themselves as the only democracy in the Middle East. So it was, their, their friendship with us is absolutely ironclad. However, Netanyahu said something that really stuck out for me and he said, in essence, alliances are great, but at the end of the day, I have to depend, defend the people of Israel. And so that was a very clear marker for him that if somebody who's a friend decides to go the other direction uh, that would leave Israel vulnerable, he and his team will take care of it themselves. And I found that to be striking. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Anybody comes to Texas, we have the same idea. So we, as Texans, as native Texans, who was a republic and then a state, and, and as Americans, I think we all agree with that. But if you look at the map of Israel, uh, within their own borders, they have known terrorist organizations uh, that have 130,000 missiles pointed at the interior of Israel. And I think if we had that problem here, and we'll discuss the map here in just a minute, uh, if we had that problem here, we'd probably live our lives with a few different priorities. You talked, I mean, a little bit about what the Prime Minister said and what comes to my mind is the Iran nuclear deal and the fact that the Biden administration is working on that, trying to revive it after it was rejected by former President Trump. And so what, what's your thought about this? And I'm sure the Prime Minister told you and your group that he opposes that. Oh, absolutely he did, but I don't think that there's anybody who, who agrees with that either on either side of the aisle in Israel. Yeah, nor do I think, like I think it, it, neither in Congress nor in the Knesset. And so I'm not sure who it is that's trying to push a new nuclear deal, but if you think about Hamas and Hezbollah being funded by, is, by Iran that threaten Israel's very existence, and then somebody wanting to do another deal, and then the last one was, wasn't good. Uh, and I think all parties agree with that. Iran is the number one uh, 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 proponent of terrorism throughout the world. They do not believe Israel has a, a right to exist. They've been pursuing nuclear weapons and we keep deciding to play this game. Additionally, constitutionally, there's no such thing as a deal. There is a, there's either a treaty or there's not. And I think the constitutionality of the Obama administration's action on a, treaty, on a deal in the first place could be argued in the co courts that it should never have been accomplished. So I'm completely opposed to it and I know most of the folks on the other side of the aisle are too. And the fact that it wasn't a treaty was why uh, Trump was able to undo it. That's correct. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, just because you talked about flying over Israel and so you could see how small it is. Um, and I, and I, we'll get to the map, but I mean, 
how should people here in North Texas view it uh, as far as the fact that it is still surrounded by a lot of people who don't like Israel? Now, obviously, Egypt and Jordan have peace with Israel, but still, um, when you consider how small it is, mm. and you know, you've got Lebanon, you've got Hezbollah and Iran, um, talk to me a little bit about that. Well, when you stand on a skyscraper in Tel Aviv and you can see the Jordan Valley and recognize that that's the border with Jordan and that that's where if Jordan were to fall, that's where the threats would come from. We don't really have that kind of appreciation, especially here in Texas in a very big state of how small that area is. I flew over Israel in about three minutes and then I had to turn before I went into the border with Jordan. So to put it in perspective for folks out here, imagine if the people of Plano had 130,000 rockets and missiles, and they decided that the people of Waxahachie didn't have a right to exist. That's the distance from the Gaza Strip to Tel Aviv. It's half that from the Lebanon border to Haifa. We went to a little town just outside of Gaza that has 30 seconds to respond if there's missiles launched, and missiles have been launched on a town called Stero. That town has 30 seconds to respond. Every house must be built with a bomb shelter in it. So that, that makes Maslow's hierarchy of needs vastly different than what we have to deal with here. But when you have 30 seconds to respond, imagine if you're here in Texas and you had 30 seconds to respond. We're in a building like this, where do you go? So that, that puts in mind differences, which is I think you know, we have the ability to worry about social issues here in the United States. On both sides of the aisle in the Knesset, it's about national security. They don't really deal with many social issues over there because it's all about continuing to live and exist. I did want to ask you two other questions about Israel. One uh, was in the headlines now about Israel and Saudi Arabia potentially uh, coming to some uh, mutual understanding uh, and a peace agreement. Um, what do you make of that? Well, I think uh, they've been trying to get Saudi Arabia to become a part of the Abraham Accords. I think that would be very valuable in light of the fact that just a few months ago, uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia had a meeting, which I think unsettled a whole lot of folks. So I think we need to finalize the Abraham Accords with Saudi Arabia to ensure that everybody's on the same page about Israel and, and its security in the Middle East. Um, so it was, you know, when, when part of the trip, we went to Yad Vashem which is the Holocaust Museum in Israel. We must never forget that the Israeli people, the Jewish people, for two millennia were searching for a home and they finally found it. And now that there's actually folks who don't believe that they have a right to exist, we need to be pushing those, those folks out because the understanding is that, that any people don't have the right to exist in the 21st century is mind-blowing to me. Uh, and that's why when it comes to Ukraine as well, what the Russians are doing in Ukraine, um, it doesn't exactly mirror what has happened to the Jewish people over time, but it does mirror it and parallel it. I do want to ask you about that. I did have uh, another question just about Israel because uh, recently the President uh, Herzog came and spoke before Congress and really pushed back on some of the members. There was one member, uh, Jayapal, if I have her pronunciation correctly, who called Israel an apartheid state. Um, what was your reaction when you heard that? The same thing that 420 other Congress members did, and there's only 222 Republicans. So everybody was repulsed by that. She got pushed back on it. She retracted it. And we had a, uh, and August Pfluger from Texas uh, had a resolution saying, no, no, we, we, that is absolute nonsense. And uh, we need to be pushing back on that. But in today's society with 24 hour news, with Twitter, with the algorithm, you can say almost anything that's crazy in office and you're going to get that broadcast all over the place. Because that's what makes money apparently these days is saying outrageous things. But I want to just encourage people, certainly in this listening area, that there's a lot of, of folks who, uh, who are just doing the job on behalf of the American people and aren't interested in saying things like that. So she gets attention from that, but she also got repudiated by her own, her own party for that. And I, I, my last question really on Israel was as far as the whole controversy over the power of the judiciary there and the reforms uh, that the Prime Minister has, has put in place. Not fully yet, but it's really drawn a lot of uh, concern, some controversy, uh, not only in Israel, obviously, where they've had these um, threats of strikes and, mm -hmm. and vast um, 
uh, rallies, et cetera, against it. Uh, what did you make of that? Um, and, and what are your concerns about it, if any? Well, I, I think it's very easy for us as Americans to look at other governments through our lens and make the same comparison and go, well, I don't understand why, why they would do something like that. There is no constitution in Israel, and currently judges pick their own. There is no advice and consent in the Senate. They pick their own. There is an amount of, and they have the ability to override any laws that they deem extreme uh, in Israel. So their setup is different than ours, and I think that making the branches more equal is a good thing from my perspective as an American who says the Supreme Court and Congress and the executive branch are equal. They don't currently have that in Israel, so trying to level the playing field I think is perfectly reasonable, and the Knesset has deemed so as well. Uh, we, we get things passed with a small majority here, and that's what they did there too, but outside influences uh, causing protests there are something that you're going to see as well because there, there are groups out there, there are folks with money out there, other nations who want to destabilize Israel, and, and by paying for protests over there, that is a good way to do it. And that's what's happened. That is, that is what I have heard from uh, when we had those meetings over there that uh, the intelligence folks would say, there's, there's outside money coming in to fund these protests. And it does, de it does show the world a, a less than stable Israel, which is not the true story, but, uh, but for their purposes, it does help degrade the opinion of Israel in other people's eyes. You brought up Ukraine before, and obviously you were there earlier this year, uh, right after President Biden was there. And I'm wondering from you, how is this war going? First of all, I don't call it a war. I know it is an invasion, but I call it a genocide. And the reason for that is, by definition, when you start exporting children of one country to another to re-educate them, that is the definition of genocide. And depending on the official numbers of somewhere around 20,000 to the unofficial number of 200,000, especially in light of watching Sound of Freedom, imagine your children being exported to another country to be re-educated, re stolen by the Russian people, and sent elsewhere to erase the Ukrainian people's history. I'm a student of history, and I recall in the 30s that Stalin killed 8 million Ukrainians through starvation in order to wipe out the society. And uh, Putin has been acknowledged as being an, a neo-Stalinist in wanting to take back Ukraine and wipe out that, that uh, history. Having said that, um, the borders of Ukraine, internationally recognized, include Crimea. So when Putin invaded, and the media called it an annexation in 2014, that was the start of this war. You don't just get to annex somebody else's property and, or land or borders. And so the Ukrainians are fighting back for their homeland. They've got the spring offensive going on right now. They hadn't fully committed until very recently their, their troops. Um, and they're making slow progress, but the Russians had eight years to fortify with trenches and other, uh, and other defensive positions the whole of the eastern and southern front. So this is going to be a long slog, not unlike World War I, but with the proper weapons and proper training, which the Ukrainians have Western training and now Western weapons, they're making progress. I will say that the United States needs to send ATACMs. The launchers they already have, the range is three times greater than that which they have right now with 500 pound warheads. We should have been giving them a long time ago. I was going to ask you about that. Is, has the U.S. help been too slow? I think as Western Europe has started to ramp up their, their uh, aid, the United States, through for various reasons of this administration, we authorize the amount of money the administration has chosen not to send some weapons, particularly the ATACMs. Uh, one, and if you'll ask Chairman McCall about this, another Texan, he will tell you that there's enough ATACMs and the administration will tell you, tell you that there aren't, but there are. And, but it does also tell us that we need to ramp up our industrial base here to prepare for the enemies overseas that we see everywhere. In fact, North Korea, Russia, and China just had a meeting in North Korea. We need to be ever present and in the moment understanding that the world does have enemies and they look a lot like they did in 1938. And I was going to ask you, I mean, why is this issue so important to you? I mean, are we on the cusp of you know, what the access you just referred to, China and North Korea, Iran, et cetera, Russia. You know, in 1947, Winston Churchill, right after they had lied with the Soviet Union to, to win World War II, he came to Missouri with Harry S. Truman, then the president, and he said the only thing the under Russian understands is force. That's the only thing he understands. And he said that 
uh, seven, over 75 years ago. And nothing's changed? And nothing's changed. So Putin has, has turned his nation into an oligarchy and he has invaded a, a sovereign nation and he's, in, he's going in total war. He is not bombing military sites, he's bombing residential centers, he's bombing, now he's bombing churches and he's stealing the children to re-educate them in Russia. This isn't a war, this is a genocide. And as a, on a moral basis alone, how can you say that, no, 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 this is, we can't support Ukraine for this reason or that reason? I don't believe that. This is, this is where force needs to be met with strength. Uh, and as, as a moral nation, we need to do so. We have aided other nations in the past for a lot less provocation than, than we are with Ukraine. And as a military man, I was in Iraq in 2006 with Morgan Luttrell, now my, my friend in Congress. And we lost people there. And we lost one guy on our last day in country. And then we lost another guy from that same op uh, operation uh, three months ago to suicide. I'm the last guy who wants to commit U.S. troops overseas. But I'm dang sure willing to help other nations defend themselves against tyranny and evil the way that the Ukrainians have. I don't want to go into any, any other wars. I, just, we, I spent most of my time in my career involved in Iraq and Afghanistan. So people need to understand that I want to help them out without committing U.S. troops. And they've done a great deal of damage to the Russian army uh, over the last year and a half. My last question on this topic uh, is, what do you make of former President Trump's uh, comments that this could, he could end it in 24 hours? Is that possible? Uh, I haven't, uh, I certainly don't advise President Trump, but I, I don't know how you do that. I don't know what his goal would be. But I think that uh, I see the Crimea as the Sudetenland. If you'll recall in, in 1939, 1938, Munich, um, the British gave part of Czechoslovakia, called the Sudetenland, to the Germans to prevent further war. At some point, these folks don't understand anything other than force. And I'd like to see Ukraine restored to its pre-2014 borders because that's what's internationally recognized. So if you think you can finish it in 24 hours, I, I'm not sure how you can do that. He's been known to say some things that, are, that, are, uh, that, that would indicate some strength where he may or may not have it. I don't know. He may have that relationship with those two leaders to end it in 20, 24 hours to uh, restore the, U, the Crimea, uh, Crimean Peninsula to Ukraine, but I don't know. Let's talk about uh, the border here in Texas, okay. the southern border. Uh, what do you make of this? Biden administration lawsuit against the state over this buoy barrier. I, it doesn't make any sense to me, just as a, as a father and a moral human being, we, we have to protect our borders. That's an inherent right of any nation to protect their own borders. And this administration has proven not to do that, especially since the Biden administration took over. Uh, there are always going to be people who are coming here to live but, and, and escape uh, other places. In fact, we've had more Cubans come through the Mexican border then came, came over on the Mariel boat lift in 1983. So they're, they're escaping tyranny to come here or, or various other things. But for me, the bigger problem is fentanyl, drug overdoses, poisonings, and human trafficking. And we just watched the Sound of Freedom on the Capitol. Speaker McCarthy showed it. But we need to protect ourselves from these things. But I think if you also stem that flow, then you're, you're going to stop the human trafficking. There are 85,000 children in the United States that are unaccounted for. Do you think they all went to great families? You and I both know that that's not the case. The largest growing uh, crime syndicate in the world is the trafficking of children for sexual exploitation. As a man and as a father, uh, that is absolutely wrong and we have to stanch that flow. All of these three things are controlled by the cartels too. Not to mention the fentanyl's coming from, uh, the, the chemicals are coming from China, but there's not 100,000 Chinese dying from fentanyl overdoses. The CCP knows everything that comes out of that country. And this is a form of asymmetric warfare that will diminish us from within. And if we're losing 107,000, now uh, the, the DEA administrator told me last week, we're gonna lose 110,000 Americans to drug overdoses and fentanyl poisonings. I say poisonings on fentanyl because one pill can kill you. And most of the time, those, the, the, the kids that are dying from fentanyl overdose think they're taking something else. And that's the number one killer of Americans, age 18 to 45. If you look at wartime numbers in World War II, we lost 305 Americans every day fighting tyranny overseas. We're losing 295 Americans every day in our backyards, in our bedrooms, to fentanyl poisonings and drug overdoses. 
I don't know what you call that other than a war, and we're not shooting back yet. So we have to stop the cartels. And my friend Dan Crenshaw has, a, has an HR that, uh, that I'm a co-sponsor of to use military force against the cartels. Really? Yes, sir. What's the likelihood of that really passing, though? Uh, at the this House, maybe, but the Senate? You know, I, I think that uh, knowing the numbers of fentanyl deaths are climbing, I mean, this is 18 to 45 year olds. These are the folks that we can't find to work in restaurants, to be cops, to be military members, to be firefighters, to uh, be welders and carpenters. This is the youth of our nation who are being killed on a, on a daily basis. So sometimes the threat of, of something occurring is enough to spur nations into action. Mexico has a southern border problem too. Most of the folks who are coming up into the United States are not from Mexico. They're from Central America or nations around the world. So the, the resolve that, that Congress must show, okay, if the executive branch isn't going to do it, Congress is going to say we need to and we just need to bring more attention to this issue because Americans are dying as fast as they did in World War II. Congressman, I wanted to ask you about the economy and inflation. Uh, statistically, we've heard that inflation has gone back down, but you go through the supermarket, gas prices have gone back up. I haven't seen, you know, prices, at least in the supermarket, come back down. Some things maybe, but not a lot. Um, so what are people here in the district telling you? We have good, hardworking people here. Um, we have a various range of, of economic backgrounds, but I will tell you this, inflation hasn't gone down. Uh, the cost of living is as high as it's ever been. I live in this district. Uh, I'm providing for two children and a, and, a, and a wonderful wife. And I went shopping on July 4th to go cook out some steaks. I ended up bringing home burger because burger these days is as much as steaks were two years ago. I went shopping for fireworks with my kids and we had some left over from last year. Well, that's what we use this year too because everything has gotten more expensive and now the average price of a gallon of gas is 350. If you're on a fixed income, and you're lower and middle class, unless your, your boss has given you uh, vast wage increases, it's hard to keep up and provide for everything that we like to and traditionally have in, in the United States of paying the bills, which have also gone up, especially during this heat wave. Electricity has gone up. Every com everything that, that we have to buy has gone up in, in cost over the last three years, and it's not coming down. And so... My next question is spending and on Capitol Hill because uh, a lot of people, and I talk to independent economists as you know, last year when all this was going on, and his thought was, he said the prevailing view was because of government spending uh, caused the inflation. And so I'm wondering, uh, there was this recent deal struck with, uh, between Speaker McCarthy, President Biden, to hold the line and keep uh, fiscal 2022 year spending for fiscal 23. Yes. Um, is this the right answer? It's a start, and everybody on my side of the aisle will tell you it's a start. That doesn't erase the $32 trillion we have in debt right now, just getting started. So what I'd also tell folks is, because of law, every dollar the federal government spends, 70 cents goes out the door without any congressional oversight because it's called mandatory spending. Then we have 30 cents on the dollar that we're eligible to look at and, and do something different with. Half of that is going to defense. At this time, we certainly don't want to cut back on any defense spending because of the threats around the world. So that leaves another 15 cents out of that dollar that we have discretionary spending on. And we said we're not cutting back on Medicaid or the VA. That further makes that piece of the pie even smaller. So this is just an effort to, to slow it down. 2023's fiscal year spending was out of this world. It was just terrible. And so we are trying to go back to 2024. That's just to start. We have to get our fiscal house in order. We have a debt that is over 110% of GDP. That's only happened once before, and that was 1947, right after World War II. And, uh, and we have some serious threats there. So government spending does cause the inflation. Uh, and we need to get our fiscal house in order and stop spending so much money, especially on uh, green projects that aren't going to, to, to give us a return on investment. So we've, over the course of the last five years, we've spent a lot more money than we're bringing in, and it has to come to a stop. Some of that was related to COVID. Some of it was Much related of to COVID. Was, and, and some of it hasn't been spent, and that's part of what we want to take back. Billions and billions were never spent. They just, they just threw money everywhere, not to mention the, the infrastructure bill, 
uh, which is $1.7 trillion, and the IRA, which was their last gasp before the Democrats lost control of the House. So there's trillions of dollars out there that have been spent that didn't actually come to anything, but they go into some, some black holes. Unlike the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, that was Democrats voted for that. Yes. Republicans did not. Correct. But the infrastructure bill was very bipartisan. It was somewhat bipartisan, but the problem with uh, it, the, when they did, a, did away with, with uh, local community spending for 10 years, then we had infrastructure start to fail. And then we spent $1.7 trillion in the infrastructure plan. However, you have an administration that through the EPA and various other agencies won't allow you to actually buy any American goods to build infrastructure. We have two cement plants here in District 6, and uh, the EPA has made it very difficult to manufacture cement. So if you're going to spend money on infrastructure and you make it hard to make rebar and cement in the United States, are you, and then you rely on nations like China, now you're, you're, you're causing more problems than you started. So the EPA has gone after a whole bunch of, of different businesses and entities in the, in the country. They need to be throttled back. So the agency rulemaking process has really gotten out of hand, and we need to look at that. And that's based on uh, the, the federal government's, the EPA's concerns over the environment? That's, that's, what, they, that's what they claim. But the, if, if you, they're making it very difficult to do business in the United States of any kind. And if you have any oversight from a federal government agency, you've got a permitting problem because they're not going to work. And then you have a rulemaking problem, which in essence is making laws. That's our job in Congress. They're making laws through rules that make it more difficult to do business. In fact, in effect, tomorrow is a rule that says you can't have incandescent light bulbs. You can't sell incandescent light bulbs anymore. Well, let the market run that. Uh, but the EPA has, and, and fortunately we turned over the Waters of the U.S. Uh, rule and so did the Supreme Court that the EPA tried to put back that said any puddle belongs to the federal government. They, they've gotten way out of hand and we need to look at the Administrative Procedures Act reforming that because if you're a, a, a bureaucrat who has no oversight, then you, you, need to, you need to have some. And Congress needs to take back some of that, that power that we have, which is taxes and laws are being made by the Congress not agencies, and they call them rules and, and fees. Congressman Jake Elsie of Waxahachie, thank you so much. We appreciate it, your time. Thanks, Jack.